All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this part two of the media conversation. Um, this morning, we heard Scott talk about media on the brain, and now he's going to be talking about the media mind. Am I right on that, the media mind? Yeah, yeah. that's the name of the afternoon one. Yep. All right. Well, we are so excited to have you guys here, um, and I'm going to turn things over to Scott. Thank you. Christy, and thank you for ASI and 3ABN and everybody who's helping make this thing happen. I got to pull up my slideshow here. And before we start with the media mind, I felt so bad at the end of the morning session that I had this slide up there and people were like, I got to share the screen first. People were like, what is that? What, what, what am I missing here? So let me go to share screen. For those who missed the morning session, it was media on the brain and I was flying through it at the end. And so let me just take like the first two minutes to show you this. There we go. Now we're sharing screen. Amusing ourselves to death was the concept on the slide there. And I, I, I really have that Mountain Dew there as a key feature in the slide because it was my addiction. Um, I was addicted to caffeine came into the truth, learned about the health message, and then gave it up. But when I was a Mountain Dew addict, here's how addictions work. This is what we were touching on at the end of Media on the Brain this morning. Um, it gives you the high, right? But that's followed by the crash. And you always need an increasing dose of the drug, the media, the video games, the pornography, the caffeine, the whatever, the actual drug, to get the same level of, of, of a hit out of it. And so it's a diminishing returns that you get from the same dose. So you increase the dose or the frequency and it's a downward spiral and leads to depression. We're going to talk about that in just a bit. And the analogy that I used was that I didn't this morning, but I wanted to use, it was like when I drank Mountain Dew, I didn't want to eat broccoli. Maybe you've done this. Have you ever eaten your dessert first? That's not smart. Mom always told you not to do that, right? You eat your dessert and then the entree doesn't taste any good. Well, the, the analogy bounced right into the scripture that we closed with last time. How sweet are your words to my taste? You see, we want the Bible to taste sweet. And so if the message didn't come through at the end because we were hustling so much, there it is. If you're sated with the things of this world, the sweetness of the word of God will not even be tasted by us. And we had this quote that says, if we want to enter into the city of God, we must feed upon the word of God and not get to the point where we've educated our tastes to love worldly things. Now on to this afternoon's session entitled The Media Mind. Overview session. The Media Mind, just like Media on the Brain, is a multi-part series and we're just hitting some of the tidbits and highlights of this six DVD set, The Media Mind, subtitle, Reclaiming the Human Soul in the Digital Dark Age. Oh, so much to talk about. I, we're only going to just barely scratch the surface. But this morning we did touch on media on the brain. If you missed that, then be, re be reminded that beltoftruth.tv is where you can go to view all of the full seminars, all six sessions, every seminar there is from the parenting seminar and overcoming lust, current events and prophecy, true education, a whole wealth of information that we've uploaded there. Uh, it's it, for those who like the streaming of videos, go there. People who want DVDs, be sure to go over to beltoftruthministries.org. You can get the full media mind and also the previous media on the brain, six DVDs. Oh, and one more thing. Be sure to email Priya at beltoftruthministries at gmail.com. She will send you a free video download as well as a discount code for those DVDs. It's a big discount code. So you'll want to make sure to send that email. Now let's begin with this poll that we had last time and I never answered. Before I give you the answer though, let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be able to examine your will for our media use. We know that this tool can be used and that you've ordained it to be used for your glory and to share the three angels' messages. And as we use it to share, may we also live the three angels' messages. Help us to be on point with your plan for our lives and how we are to live to bring glory to you and blessing to those around us. And so we just ask for your blessing now as we study and as we think through these things and 
reason together. May your spirit speak to each one of us. We know you are present everywhere. Even though we are in many different locations, you're here where we are gathered. And we just love you. Help us to love you more. And may this all be for you and about you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Teens now consume blank number of hours of entertainment media per day. Do you know what the number is? And there, were, there was a poll. I don't know if, Christy, you want to share the results of that. But let's see how many people got this right. You can just chime in with that if you want. Teens now consume nine hours of, it was entertainment and social media combined. Nine hours. Now, by the way, this was before COVID. So it's even higher now. But um, that's some catastrophically high numbers that are coming in. 45% of teens admit that they're almost constantly on their devices when just a few years before it was only 20% only. That's quite a bit, but doubling, a doubling. What do you got there, Christy? Do you have the answer? Yeah, so how many hours does the average teen spend? There were a few people that said five hours. Um, yeah. There were four people that said seven hours, but the overwhelming number that uh, chose nine hours. Ding, 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 mm -hmm. good job, guys, good job. <laughs> So yeah, almost constantly on our devices. It's almost coming to the point where like the number of hours is kind of an irrelevant exercise because you're just on all the time. But this blew me away. Somebody sent me this article from CNN. By the numbers, kids are not spending more time with screens than they were in the 80s. Huh? Wait a minute. Kids are not spending more time, typo, more time with screens and they were in the, I grew up in the 80s and it wasn't anything like this. And you could go from your own uh, subjective judgment or you could go to the data. Twenge Martin of Spitzberg at San Diego State University crunched the numbers, 1980s, 3.5 hours per day of entertainment media, 2007, five hours per day, 2016, almost a doubling just in that decade right there with just ubiquitous internet smartphone use coming in, into the picture. So yeah, almost a tripling since the 80s. So the CNN article, um, how about we put it this way? We're going to contrast the media mind and the mind of Christ. The name of this session is the media mind. If we are of the mindset, like from media on the brain, where we just passively receive everything coming our way, the Edward Bernaysian worldview of mind control, the media mind becomes deceivable. But the mind of Christ is critically thinking, which brings us to poll number one of this session. And poll number one, Christy's going to post it. Do you trust the mainstream media sources? I kind of loaded this one up by giving that CNN article with the nonsense in it, but uh, just in general, do you trust the mainstream media sources like CNN to tell the truth about current events and developments in contemporary society? We'll see what you guys think about that. On to the info. Now, it's easy to pick on the teens here, okay? Because uh, they're the, the highest numbers. But did you know that parents are consuming nearly eight hours per day of entertainment and social media. They're rivaling the teens there. And that's in addition to media use for work. This nine hours is in addition to time spent on media for school. This is just entertainment and social media. This is just entertainment and social media. The average adult spends more time looking at screens than sleeping. The average American spends 65% of their waking hours consuming media. The average American now spends 4.7 hours on their smartphone per day and checks their phones 80 to 150 times per day and still somehow manages to watch four hours of TV per day on top of all of this. You would think TV numbers would be just catastrophically through the floor, but we're still watching TV like never before. Now with these numbers, it's tempting to be like, all right, good. Scott's got a seminar for those people, right? This doesn't need to touch me and challenge my media use, but listen to what the Bible says. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. So it wouldn't be wise for us to go, okay, this is where the world's at, the culture is at, and I'm here, and so I'm good because I'm measuring and comparing by others. We want to ask, God, what's your will for me? These digital tools can be used for good. We're doing it right now in an informative and spiritual way, not entertainment, not amusement, not mind control, not manipulation, not frontal load suppression, not limbic system enhancement. That's all from media on the brain. If you missed it, I won't repeat it right now. Just go to beltoftruth.tv. But 
here we are using media and we want to use it in a balanced way, even good media, even social media that we use for spiritual purposes and ministry purposes and, and real wholesome purposes. Where are our numbers to be according to the Lord's will yes, for yes, us? Now, I want to show you something here. I'm just going to mute the video because th th this is all you need to see. Okay, you got the baby. This starts from a very early age, doesn't it? Baby playing with iPad. Now watch what she's doing with the magazine. She thinks the magazine is supposed to be like the iPad. Did you see it? Let's see it again. She's pinching it, swiping it like the iPad. That video went viral because they're like, what are we doing to our children? What are we doing to all of us when young people are having hyperkyphosis? It's more of a forward head posture from so much of this for so many hours per day. And so somebody made a joke out of it that they're getting permanent forward head syndrome. That means we'll have to update what the evolutionists put out there. They will have to update their chart. We know that we did not evolve from monkeys, but according to their theorizing, we would have to come back down and identify Phono sapien, no longer Homo erectus, but now coming forward, kind of a silly thing somebody put out there. But I want to point out another thing on video that now before I do that, this one right here, blew me away because we're on our devices so much so constantly that people were walking into oncoming traffic and there were a number of traffic incidents involving people just walking into the street because they didn't even think about where they were going with their phones so they put these stop and go for pedestrians on the sidewalk where you're looking down because this is where we live now watch this guy this is where we live now you're like there's no way he's going to walk into that it's got a barrier he's going to walk right through it yeah he walked right through it and fell right in that is unbelievable. I hope he's okay. So uh, there you have it. So poll number two, have you ever had a minor or major accident or incident because of being on your phone? Christy's going to post that one right now and report to us the results of poll number one. If you're able to do that, quick on the yeah. draw there, Christy. <laughs> so for poll number one, do you trust the mainstream media? We had one person say that they trusted, had almost 100% confidence in the mainstream media. Two people said they have some confidence. Uh, two people said that they have little confidence and three people said that they have almost zero confidence in the mainstream media. All right. Good to hear you guys' perspective on that. I'm not trying to be mean to CNN, but that, that was false. But anyway, um, yeah, hopefully we can, we can go to get some good news as well and read from a wide variety of sources and understand different angles and perspectives and what's being construed and what's, uh, anyway, I could teach a whole course on that right now. I used to actually in the high school level, but how about poll number two? You guys go vote on that one right now. It's hard, I'm sure, to vote on polls while I keep going, but the media mind is, after what we just saw right there, checked out, right? I mean, we're totally checked out, but the mind of Christ is engaged. You see, there's a difference. God wants us in tune with the people around us with the nature around us, with the objects around us, with the traffic. If we're engaged, then we'll hear the voice of God. If we're checked out, we're not, we're oblivious to the needs around us, to people and all of that. It's almost to the point where it's like time to learn to be human again. You know what I mean? In our social life, in our spiritual life, in labor, in study, in every aspect of what it means to be human, in the arts and the creative things, in, in productivity and ingenuity and in, in, in the intellectual, in, in, in having a mind and in engaging in the non-virtual, three-dimensional world, learning to be human again. But the sad reality is we touch, tap, and swipe our devices 2,617 times per day. That's nearly a million times per year that's more than times when we touch our family and our pets and soil and wood and nails combined. We're living in a virtual place now, which takes its toll when in the evening, the firelight used to come on and the candles and the sun would set and the color of the light would change versus the blue light of the screens, which alters our melatonin. And when the Bible says, God giveth his beloved sleep, Thou shalt lie down and thy sleep shall be sweet. God wants us to sleep well. He wants us to really feel good and practice the health message. But bright light at night is disrupting that in a major way. I'm skipping a whole amazing segment on that right now just for the sake of time. I'll just sum it up with the media mind is tired. But the mind of Christ is energized. So poll number three, what time do you typically go to bed? Um, and Christy, you could go ahead and announce the results for, for, from poll number two. We're stacking a lot of our polls right at the beginning here just for fun to get us 
get us rolling. Go ahead. All right. So poll number two was, have you ever had a minor or major accident or incident because of being on your phone? So we had four people say yes, maybe once or twice. Um, we had one person say yes quite a few times, um, but we did have six people who said never um, by God's grace. I'm so mean because I'm making you guys answer these and I don't have to. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, thank you for thank you for taking a part of that. What time do you typically go to bed? We'll get the answer to that one in just a minute. And for those who joined late, you're in the middle of a media mind seminar. You were getting the overview of the six part series, actually five part, the sixth one has all the MP3s on it, the audio um, audio files of all five sessions. We're not doing five sessions today. Well, we're, yeah, we are, we're doing five sessions in one, one condensed highlights reel. I'm giving you the tidbits, but beltoftruthministries.org is where you get the DVDs, get the discount code from Priya, email her, right away after this or even right now if you multitask while i'm talking belt of truth ministries at gmail.com ask her for the free download video and the discount code for the full series so belt of truth.tv for those who don't want dvds is streaming there i just had to repeat that because i know people come in late did you know you now have a shorter attention span than a goldfish eight seconds is the average human attention span in the industrialized world. Now, does God want us to have a good attention span? He says, heed, take heed over 80 times in the King James. Pay attention to what God is saying. I want a long attention span for the word of God, for listening to sermons. And also a long attention span is associated with higher level frontal lobe function and a shortening attention span is associated with uh, reducing frontal lobe function, which is where we have self-control, emotional regulation, all of our ability to govern the impulses of the flesh, frontal lobe is so important, but the media mind is becoming distractible. The mind of Christ, though, is attentive, attentive to his word. Now, God has the answer to all of this. How about this one? Nature, attention span. You put children in nature, and you have them play on a playground surrounded by greenery. Their attention span starts to increase by leaps and bounds. You put the same type of children in the same type of playground equipment, but surrounded by an urban jungle. You think about the inequities in our society. These kids don't get the same boost and benefit and bonus out of their outdoor play because it's a concrete area instead of green. There's something about green. What is that? There's a ton of awesome studies on nature and the benefits of nature. Uh, we'll have to talk about that another time. But also when it comes to like creative thinking and having the light bulb go off and you're like, yes, I just solved a problem or whatever. Oftentimes the creative genius moment happens after 15 to 20 minutes of really mulling something over, weighing the options, evaluating, experimenting, thinking through things, and 15 minutes is the typical average, they say, for that, for that light bulb to go on. And how long is our attention span? Eight seconds is the average human attention span in the industrialized world, shorter than that of a goldfish. 15 to 20 minutes is actually a thousand seconds. So if we only have an eight second attention span, we're going to struggle with this one as well. 77% of people admit that the moment they have a down moment and their thoughts are not immediately occupied with something else, they just pick up their phone. Just like, what's on? I didn't, nothing was demanding my attention. I didn't need to go on there, but I went on there to just find something that I need to do. 77% of us just go right on. The media mind becomes more dull. The mind of Christ though, creative. We've been given a power akin to that of the creator, the power to think and to do. And it is the work of true education to develop this power in the young that we would be thinkers, not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. We are small C creators in God's image. Pretty fun stuff. Now this gets very serious. Dr. Nicholas Cardaris, author of the book, Glow Kids says, I've worked with over a thousand teens in the past 15 years and have observed that students who have been raised on a high tech diet, not only appear to struggle more with attention and focus, we covered that, but also seem to suffer from an adolescent malaise that appears to be a digital, a direct byproduct of their digital immersion. Indeed, over 200, 200 peer reviewed studies point to screen time correlating to increased ADHD, screen addiction, increased aggression, depression, anxiety, and even psychosis. 200 peer reviewed studies. So the verdict is in. This is not something like, hmm. We wonder if all this entertainment media and social media and video gaming and everything is good for kids. It is absolutely catastrophic for their mental health. That's why the founding president of Facebook 
Sean Parker, right there with Mark Zuckerberg at the beginning, he said, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. Speaking of social media, he was on like this guilt tour, this apology tour speaking and saying, I'm sorry for what we've done. God only knows what this is doing to our children's brains. God does know and he has the answer because while the media mind is dysfunctional, the mind of Christ is balanced and well, and God can do that process of transforming and renewing our minds that we talked about this morning. Christy, let's get poll number four up because I wanna ask about not just kids, but since COVID-19 hit, have you, maybe you are a kid or maybe, but whatever our age, have you felt an increase in any of these feelings, loneliness, depression, fear, anxiety. And what are the results for poll number three? What time are we going to bed? Yeah, Scott. So one person said before 9.30. That's impressive. Uh, eight people said between 9.30 and 10.30. That's by far the most common answer. And one person between 10.30 and 11.30 and three people after 11.30. All right. All right. Thank you for sharing that. The interrogation is over. I have not. I, I, I have no more questions that uh, inquire on such things, but people like to share their personal thing on the poll. That's what I'm told. So I've never done polls like this before, but uh, the organizer said, get some polls in there. People will enjoy that. But um, this other one really is hitting to something that is a struggle for a lot of us. Uh, this thing about, are, you fe is, are we feeling more lonely in this context of COVID-19? People were already struggling with these with these feelings with the media use that we've been engaged in. So let's talk a lot about mental health and child development and practical things in this session. And before I launch into that, really, I want to use an analogy here. Okay, you see the the optometrist's office and the instrument comes in front of your eyes there, and you walk into the office saying, "Hey, doc, you know I'm seeing good. I don't need glasses. I'm all right." And he says, okay, any blurred vision, any problems since you've seen me last? No, no, all is good. I'm seeing crystal clear. Everything's good. And then he goes, all right, I'll read that top line. You're like, okay, A-R-V-W-M-Q. He's like, then read this second line, please. Wait, the second line? I'm supposed to be able to read that? Is that a G or a C or an O? Is that an F or a hashtag? Doc, I can't read that line. Hmm, let's see something here. Which one is clearer, one or two? Um, definitely two is clearer. Two or three? Um, two is clearer there. Two or four? Two is the clearest there as well. And then he breaks it to you. You know, you thought you were seeing clearly, but this is your natural naked eye. This is your new prescription. Number two is a clearer view of the world around you, huh? So the analogy for us is maybe we want to try something different after this session. Try some, just, just try on a new set of lenses to look at the world through. And what I mean by that is our media habits. Have you tried a fast? Have you tried taking a period of time off something, a social media platform, whatever it might be? Because you just might find that after that test, even though you thought everything was good, like we're, nobody thinks, well, few, few people think, ah, oh, this is terrible. I got to make changes right now. Like we all like to get in our rut and get in our comfortable zone. But when we try something different, sometimes we're like, whoa, it wasn't as clear and awesome as I thought. And my emotional health is improved and I have greater clarity of thought and more energy. You ever done that with a diet? Oh, now you're hitting too close to home, Scott. Yeah, trying changes in your diet and afterwards, you're, you're okay. I thought I was good before. Now I feel even better. Or maybe you're in a situation you're just like, I just do feel totally rotten and I, I'm facing that. Please give me a program for a solution. A lot of it can involve a reduction of media use or elimination of certain types of media. Worldly media, we already handled that last session. We're done with that because it's worldly. But how much just so much of this screen time God has the answer to this issue of the mental health dilemma. I'm gonna share with you some findings of Dr. Victoria Dunkley in her book, Reset Your Child's Brain. Buy that book for any parent who has kids, any teacher who has children in their classroom virtually or, or in person. 
And uh, fantastic book. We sell that on our website, beltoftruthministries.org. It's not from a Christian perspective, but it's just solid science and experience that she's done in her practice and that cites all the research as well. Dr. Dunkley has treated hundreds of children with previously diagnosed disorders. They come into her office with ADHD, DMDD, which is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, depression, anxiety, bipolar. And she gives them a prescription. As a practicing psychiatrist, she prescribes a certain prescription and it's not a pharmaceutical prescription. It is a 100% media abstinence for three weeks. You might say that sounds impossible. Yeah, it's the only, you have to really be committed to go for it, but 100% media abstinence for three weeks. What are the results? The results are 80% of these children had the majority of their symptoms disappear. That is incredible. 80% have the majority of their symptoms disappear. 50% of them have all their symptoms disappear. So they're totally cured. She's not allowed to use that word, but I'm not diagnosing, curing, or treating anything either. But screen time is a contributing factor to virtually all of the children she has treated. Get that, 80% of these kids have the majority of their symptoms disappear and half of them are totally, totally symptom free at the end of it. So the media mind is not well. It's true the media is causing these things as we'll continue to see. But the mind of Christ is healing. When you get out into nature, when you engage socially, when you do things in the three-dimensional non-virtual world learning to be human again, as God designed, and when you live with a mission and purpose, living out the three angels' messages by saying, I'm not going to sit as a bump on a log as a, a, a consumer of entertainment. I'm not going to live on social media. I may be on there to contribute something to the world of value. But I'm going to ask God, what do you want me to do with my day today? How can I bring glory to you? How can I find joy in life? Because he wants us to have joy and we'll have the healing he has called us to have and invited us to participate in. But kids need to be learning tech skills as children, right? I'm out. Check this out. A dolphin can use an iPad. Chimpanzee can play a video game. And this one right here, this chimpanzee is actually using a smartphone. And you might say, well, he's just sitting there watching it. But watch this. Not only is he watching the video, but he actually can go and scroll through and find other videos to watch. <laughs> so they call it a smartphone because the phone is smart and you don't really have to be that smart to use it. If Jim Fancy using a smartphone, he's like that video. No, let's go find another one. Oh, this one, this looks interesting. So, oh, wow. I don't feel so smart after all. Did you know that Steve Jobs, before he died, his kids, he, he admitted in an interview that his, his kids were not using devices in the home. Um, they, they limited tech very strictly in the Jobs family and in the Bill Gates family. It was 45 minutes max of um, internet use, and it was for productive educational purposes only. Tim Cook doesn't have children. He's the current CEO of Apple, but he didn't want his nephew on a social media platform when asked about it. He's like, I don't want, I don't want the young people that I love to be on there at all. Adam Alter wrote a book about the, the addictive uh, principles embedded in the media and how these social networking and video game designing companies are actually trying to get people addicted. And he pointed out that in his interviews of video game designers, a bunch of the video game designers themselves would not play the games or allow their children to play the games that they were making because they're so addictive. This is Alex Constantinople, uh, CEO of the Outcast Agency, and she has zero screen time for her five-year-old. And for her older kids, it's a max of 30 minutes per day. Five-year-old, by the way, the World Health Organization came out last year, about one year ago, and they said the less, the less the better. Less media use, the better for children up to age five, which was a much stronger statement than our American Academy of Pediatrics was willing to make. I guess they feel they need to meet people where they're at or whatever, but there is zero research proving that media for young children is, is helpful. It's only shown to be harmful. And that's why the engineers and the mid-level people and the young adults and the, the Silicon Valley tech gurus and the wizards of modern tech, they to a person, it's like the consensus that that, that came out in, in journalistic investigations and exposés that these people are super protective of their children and keeping them from screens and putting them in like um, nature-based schools and things like that instead of high-tech schools, schools like Waldorf that don't have any screen-based education at all until middle school or high school even. 
And uh, this would be uh, Sherry Turkle on the East Coast at MIT. And she says the same thing over here. Everybody's at a Montessori school and has rules about no computers at the dinner table, no computers at breakfast. This is MIT, the Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology. No computers in the classroom, no computers there. Same story as on the West Coast. These are entertainers. So I'm kind of on the topic from last session here with media on the brain. But these entertainers all admitted in interviews that their children are not allowed to consume the Hollywood and entertainment industry content that they are themselves a part of producing. But these guys, it was very interesting also in their interviews, they both acknowledged a very important time of the day that was sort of a what we would call a sacred time, a, a special time in their families, and that was mealtime. They insisted on mealtime together. And Steve Jobs says, oh, yeah, we try to have meaningful conversations. Nobody's on devices. There were no devices in the Jobs family, even though the iPad was out. They asked him, what do your kids think of the iPad? They must think this thing is so cool. He's like, no, they've never touched one. They've never seen or used one because that's not how it goes in our family. We do not have Wi-Fi, one restaurant says. Talk to each other. Pretend it's 1995. I like that one. That's good. But we go on a date. And Penn State University study found that when, when people go on a romantic date, the majority of the time, the phone is disrupting the date, and they called it technoference. And they said lower relationship satisfaction is, of course, um, correlated with higher levels of technoference. So God wants us to pay attention to the people around us, right? To show interest in love, like Christ's method alone. Even the people we love the most, sometimes them even more than others, we give them the cold shoulder and we, we fub them. We snub them with the phone, right? Um, it's called fubbing. Uh, University of Michigan called it contamination and tension that, that manifests in the home when parents are on their devices in the home environment, contamination and tension. Now half of families text each other in the same house. Experts say that this tech craze could have a catastrophic effect on family life. I love it when the researchers just come out and say it. They're like, it's catastrophic to family life. It's contamination, it's tension, it's technoference, because that's what they're noticing in sociological studies of human relationships and how the technology is interfering in that. And this was prophesied, by the way, the disruption in the family. Jesus said that in the last days, it'll be two against three and three against two. And, the, and man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Second Timothy three says that the, the children will be alienating from the parents and disobedient to their parents in the last days. And in Malachi chapter four, God has the answer to this because in Malachi, it says, even though the hearts are divided in the last days, it says in the last days, just before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the hearts of the children will be turned to the hearts of the fathers and the hearts of the fathers will be turned to the hearts of the children. And that's part of the mission of living out the three angels messages is that restoration of the family because it is the children who finish the work. Oh boy, I wish I could finish. I wish I could go into raising the remnant right now. We've got incredible stuff from Spirit of Prophecy on this. And it points out in Joel, and it points out in a number of places in the Bible, your young daughters will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. And the children actually shouted out Jesus, uh, the announcement of Jesus' first coming. Hosanna, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. When he came in on the donkey into Jerusalem and all the you know Pharisees and the rulers were, were grumpy and the children were joyful that he was their coming king, well, it says in Adventist home that the children will be doing the same for the second coming of Christ. And when the older members of the church cannot do the work that the children will raise up and, and, and present the truth in a way where they are endued by the spirit of God, it's powerful, powerful stuff. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, it talks about doing life with your children, right? That's what it means to be a family. And it says, walk as you walk by the way, as you sit in your house, as you, as you rise up and lie down, speak of the commandments of God with your children. As you sit in your house, as you rise up and lie down, that's morning and evening worship. That's meal time. Psalm 128 says that the children will rise up like olive plants round about our tables. It's speaking of mealtime, something that these guys understood. Mealtime is important. It's even there in the Bible. The children will rise up like olive plants round about our table. Talk about these things as we sit in our house, not just morning and evening worship as we rise up and lie down, but as we sit in our house as well. Um, in Malachi 4, I mentioned as well with the hearts being reunited. So that's the good news. But the reality is children spend twice as long on their smartphones as talking to their parents. So all talking to your parents combined doesn't reach half the amount that the children are spending on their phones. The media mind alone, but the mind of Christ is connected, connected with each other, connected with Christ, reconnected. 
I had a room full of teachers at a teacher's convention, NAD teacher's convention. I was presenting a lot of this very same information. And I wanted to poll them and ask them, how, how are the kids doing academically, socially, spiritually, with regard to their character, their interests, their curiosity, their motivation, their ingenuity, their problem solving abilities. Like I went down the whole list of all the things that we're trying to get out of our children and help them develop into. And to a person, every single one of them said that every single one of these measures had dipped and dropped in the last just five or 10 years since the digital devices started to consume their lives. That is very serious. When I saw a unanimous response, and then Dr. Catherine Steiner Adair found the same thing in interviewing preschool teachers, particularly finding that the, the children were struggling with emotional intelligence and sociability and eye contact. This is what a daycare provider pointed out to me. She was a daycare provider for 50 years. And I said, what's the number one change? I know you could talk to me for an hour about this, but she said the biggest change is that which is on the social level and empathizing and, and being able to have conversations. So, so verbal, relational, social, emotional intelligence. And that's what all of these people are saying, the same thing that this is being ruined by the inundation of constant screen time. You're not looking into eyes anymore. You're looking into screens. Even I like using this technology, but I was just talking about this with Christy when we were setting up the live stream. You can't quite look at each other. Like I'm looking at your face here and you're looking at it down here and the, the camera's up here. So these are great technologies, but hopefully we're still finding ways to get together, right? To, uh, to get into nature, kids playing together outdoors. I don't think anybody's gonna die, right? They're, it's more dangerous for them to just be cooped up inside all the time on screens. So they did a study where the, the kids of Los Angeles got out of the city, went to a nature camp, an adventure camp, and they did team building exercises and they did all of this just on a secular level. They found kids emotional intelligence after five days in nature with no screens, five days of being human started to improve their emotional intelligence, their EQ. That's awesome, right? Empathy, that means love, by the way. That's kind of central to our religion is loving our neighbor as ourselves, loving God. Empathy means thinking about other people's best interests and feelings, beneficence, concern, care, living the three angels' messages. But it was 40 years ago that the famed scholar Neil Postman wrote the book, The Disappearance of Childhood. And it sounded like hyperbole. It sounded like chicken little. The sky is falling. Childhood is going to disappear. He was seeing the writing on the wall with becoming the television dominating so much of childhood, video games starting to come in. He says, you're, going, you're witnessing children not having a childhood and it's going to bear terrible fruits. And as you look today, how much of children's time is spent on screens versus normal childhood stuff, nature, play, study, time with their parents, books, music, very little of those things are happening now. In fact, Richard Liu found in research that was done in the UK, and he reported it in The Last Child in the Woods, a uh, great book. He pointed out that the majority of 11-year-old children, when asked in surveys, admit that they have never climbed a tree before in their entire life. The majority of 11-year-olds have never climbed a tree, ever. I climbed one almost every day when I was 11. That, that is unbelievable to me. There was a tree in my backyard. I go there all the time just to get up there and kind of rock back and forth on one of the branches. I, that's normal. But the majority of these kids have never done it. The average child between the ages of six and 16 is spending twice as much time just playing video games than all outdoor activities combined. And by the way, this isn't just for kids. We all need that naturist exposure. There are hundreds of studies just showing the, the correlation, the, the causation of nature reducing anxiety and stress. Um, we all need a bit of that this year, don't we? Get outside, get into nature. Oh, the media mind is just immersed though in a counterfeit reality. I pointed out this morning that, the, that three quarters of UK children, that would be similar to America, three quarters of children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates spend outdoors. And so they're being inducted into everything virtual, everything screen, immersed in a counterfeit reality. It's not the real reality that's around us, the three-dimensional, the non-virtual, the sights and smells and sounds and laughter and facial contact and touch and physical things. 2,617 touches, taps, and swipes on here in the virtual. The mind of Christ can be awake to the wonders 
of God's reality. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing right there. But the media mind is enclosed in a virtual prison. Three quarters of kids in the UK, less outdoor time than prison inmates. But the mind of Christ, take a deep breath, is fully alive. Except when you get into the narcissism epidemic and the average young adult, they say, will, sp will take 25,000 selfies during their lifetime. There's nothing evil about a selfie, but 25,000, that's an orientation on self, an awful lot. And uh, there's a number, growing number of selfie wrist injuries, doctors say, and more than 200,000 teens had plastic surgery last year. Teens are having plastic surgery? Well, the social media is pushing it because the more you are on social media, young and old, the more likely you are to feel inadequate. Oh, I don't measure up. I'm not as good as other people on there with my career, with my looks, etc. And so you might say, okay, well, I heard two things there. I heard narcissism, like look at me, the narcissism epidemic, and inadequacy, like low self-worth. So which is it? Is it narcissism or is it insecurity? The answer to that is yes, both, because the devil wants to get us in one of those two states. If he can get us thinking we're the greatest, it's like, I will ascend above the other angels. I will be in the position of God, the devil's thing going on, right? But, but also he wants to get us beaten down because he's the accuser. And he wants people to feel like, you know, God could never love me and I don't measure up and all of that. So the media mind is going to be narcissistic and or insecure. But the mind of Christ, secure in Christ. And how do you become secure in Christ? You think about, okay, well, what is my value? What is my worth? How is our worth and value measured? Well, Jesus, our, our creator and redeemer, has already established that in creation and in redemption. He made you. You're his kid already your worth is uh, is immeasurable how is your feeling about your kids if you don't have kids you've seen people that feel that way how about the cross he was willing to come down from heaven to sacrifice his life even if you were the only sinner needing salvation never again do i need to feel the press of the accuser saying, since you don't measure up, you're not cool or funny or pretty or popular or successful or whatever, that you have anything less than infinite worth in the sight of God. Jesus' life was sacrificed for yours. In the estimation of heaven, your life is worth that much? Equivalent to the life of the Son of God? That's impossible. That's extravagant. And that's the point. Because there were moments when Jesus was on that cross that he did not see himself coming forth as a victor from the tomb past those portals of death. Let that sink in how much he loves you, that he would have been willing, and he went through it. He didn't just like grit his teeth on the cross and like, okay, I'm coming back right after this. Yes, he knew he was coming back when he prophesied that he would rise again. But during those dark moments on the cross, all he could say is, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was willing to be blotted out of existence for eternity so that you could live in heaven and have life. That's your value to him. Let that sink in every day. The love of God. I mean, we can't even measure that, can we? How is it measured? The, the, the life of the son of God, can you measure that? So when the father said to Jesus, this is my beloved son whom I love and whom I am well pleased, as the dove came down. Did you know that it says in Desire of Ages that those same words apply to us? Oh, but I'm, I, I can't be well pleased and I'm, I'm terrible. I've sinned. But if we repent and we have the righteousness of Christ, we are accepted by God as if we live the life of Jesus. That's what righteousness by faith means. And he says, I'm well pleased in you. You have the robe of the righteousness of Christ. That's incredible. That inspires me to want to live like Christ and find his power to overcome every besetment. But the devil is still trying to push people down even through social media. Look at this. Facebook told advertisers it can identify teens feeling insecure and worthless. It was a big scandal because these leaked documents came out and they were bragging to advertisers like, yeah, we can identify people's feelings of low self-worth when they're on our platform. And that's when you target them with your ads, because that's when people are, are easily vulnerable and victimized by your, your um, predator to predatory type of activity absolutely diabolical in, the, in in exploiting people's, well, that was the word that Sean Parker used, actually. He says, 
you know, he remember when he said, God only knows what it can do to our children's brains. He also says these platforms have been designed deliberately to exploit the vulnerabilities of human psychology. Makes me want to rethink whether I should be on there for how long, who should be on there and all of that. We'll talk about that in just a second. But young people, how about right now? These precious young people, after holding steady for decades, immediately after the advent of social media, teen suicide rose by 70% in just 10 years. Among age 10 to 14, the rate went up 133%. Among 12 to 14 year old girls, suicide went up threefold. Why are more American teenagers than ever suffering from severe anxiety? American Psychological Association survey shows teen stress rivals that of adults. And just after the advent of social media, depression leapt 60% among teens. So all of this happened right when social media came and smartphones. Depression is up massively. Also ADHD, which we talked about earlier, and, and distraction, and um, just low, low attention span. Um, stress, anxiety, suicide skyrocketing. So this is a very vulnerable population. I mean, you remember your teen years. If you're not a teen, you remember back to that. It was very insecure age. This is a very, very, very difficult time to be engaging in that social media world and it's harming most, harming the majority of young people to be on there. More research says Facebook can cause depression among millennials. So this is adults in their 30s and late 20s and mid to late 20s, early 30s. Uh, depression, young adults, mental health issues increasing significantly during the decade of social media and digital devices. So the bottom line of any age really the media mind, the more we are on media, the more we're going to be depressed, anxious, and stressed. The mind of Christ, though, content, joyful, and peaceful. And that's what Jesus wants for us. So what boundaries do you need to find? This is not a condemnation of every person of every age and every disposition and level of insecurity and uh, gender and all of that. Uh, nobody should ever be on social media. No, I'm not saying that. Um, there are certain populations that are especially vulnerable that I would just say, why risk it? And plus, these young people are getting into a whole bunch of worldliness on there as well without supervision. And then there's individual personality types that are especially, um, you know, struggling. Like if you're a person who craves likes, if you, they're like the like button, I got to get my likes, you're going to be more prone to these mental health conditions when with more social media use. Also, if you have thoughts like my friends have a better life than me, other people are happier than me. If you tend to compare yourself with others, just get off of there, just get off of there. Because what they've done is they've, they've done studies, University of Pennsylvania and Denmark, different studies. One, the Pennsylvania one reduced social media time to 30 minutes. The Denmark study eliminated social media. And in both cases, they found depression across the board drop significantly. I think most people should just get off there for the most part, but um, you test it out, try a different set of lenses. And just, this was just one week, just one week later, see how you feel without the, the Facebook and the Instagram and all the online chatting and everything. But back to the teens and the young people, Dr. Twingy found that the percentage of teens that have a job today has been cut in half. The average teen now gets less exercise than the average 60 year old. They're studying less, they do less volunteer work, they do fewer extracurricular activities and they're getting their driver's licenses later than ever before. Maybe that's a silver lining because when I was 16 and getting my driver's license, in 1996, I was getting into trouble with my friends because that was before the social media and all of that. But now kids are just sitting in their room on their phone most of their life and instead of living life and doing things that young people normally used to do. But aren't they going to learn some skills from playing video games? Well, Maggie Jackson, author of the book Distracted, says video games teach the kinds of skills useful for playing more video games. And not much more. Great quote. Inside the rehab, saving young men from their internet addiction, video games and pornography, not just teenagers, but young men who, the person who founded this institute, was like, you would be shocked how many of these young men don't know how to make breakfast, don't know how to clean a bathroom. It's like they've been totally enabled and insulated in their virtual world and just don't know anything basic. The media mind becomes lacking of practical skills. I'm skipping a ton of content on this. There's a ton more to say about this, but the mind of Christ is well-rounded. And for that, watch a true education seminar, like Undoctrinated. We've got two seminars on true education, but the part I'm skipping on this is, is of course, in the media mind, beltoftruth.tv, to view both of those. 
Now I put some of my notes on the screen here because I was thinking about this, that Revelation 13 just predicts a time where the whole world wonders after the beast and people are in herd mentality. They're following the deception. Mob psychology throughout history does not have a good track record. You get witch hunts, you get gang violence, you get mobs with torches and pitches and forks and this uh, forks, <laughs> pitchforks, <laughs> not forks, pitchforks. <laughs> Mob violence is not something to laugh at even when I trip over my words, but anyway. Um, racial lynchings, you name it. I mean, are we seeing some of that kind of thing going on today? But social media fuels it. The Bible says don't follow a crowd to do evil in Exodus 23. But did you know that a bunch of teenagers were eating laundry detergent like three years ago? It became this trend, this popular thing that was fun to do. People were eating, swallowing, Tide Pods. I'm not making this up. This was a real thing. So yeah, don't follow a crowd into doing evil. Don't follow the beast. Follow the lamb and follow the word of God and be an individual. Be independent. Be, be critically thinking. Be able to make a decision. Even if everybody around you seems to be going crazy, you love them anyway and stand for the right, though the heavens may fall. Speaking of social things, they did a study where they had people put a phone on the table. Sit down with a stranger. Get to know them. Have a conversation. Here's your conversation starters. And at the end, they with a series of questions, tried to gauge the quality of the bond that was formed between the two people in the experiment. They did a number of those. And then they did a number of these. Instead of a phone present, you put a notebook there. And then they gauged the quality of the bond that those two people had in conversation in a short period of time. And they found that the people who just had the phone sitting there, and you weren't allowed to use it. So nobody was using their phone, it was just sitting there. And the quality of that bond was lower than if there was no phone present. Sometimes you just got to have the phone in the other room. In our house, we just keep it on the charger, keep it in the back room. We don't have it constantly on us and interrupting with our children. So we're not, we're not able to empathize as much and identify with people. Empathy dropped 40% in college students in 2000. The media mind is more cold. The bond is not as good. But the mind of Christ is caring. That's what we're called to do, to live the three angels' messages. Former Facebook executive feels tremendous guilt for what he helped to make. So this is another guy like Sean Parker. He came out and he's like, he didn't say God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. He said, we are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. Social fabric. The connection human to human is being, giving way, is being replaced with this virtual con communication. Most teens, most, two thirds of teens, when you ask them, would you rather just hang out with your friends on Snapchat or would you rather get together? Two thirds say, I'd just rather chat with them. I'd rather just text them. Two thirds of teens don't even wanna see their friends. If between the two, why, why did I need to get together? Like, why do you need to actually go see people? The media mind is disconnected. The mind of Christ is affectionate. Former Surgeon General sounds the alarm on the loneliness epidemic. Nearly half of Americans now report that they sometimes or always feel alone. This was before COVID. Loneliness for teens jumped 31% in just five years after the advent of the smartphone and social media. A full 25% of Americans admit in surveys that they have zero close confidants in their life. That is double the amount from the 1980s. And the number of people that you feel you can turn to for social support has dropped 33%. So now more than ever before, we need the body of Christ, right? Not everybody has a family or your family's grown or, you know, death or divorce or separated people. This is the family of God. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We need it now more than ever before. Safely, prudently, respectfully assembling ourselves together. This same study that I told you about last time, Pennsylvania, Denmark, two studies, found loneliness drop 36% when people got off social media. That's awesome. The media mind is lonely, but the mind of Christ is fulfilled. He also said this, you don't realize it, but you are being programmed. So this technology is a, a social engineering mechanism by the powerful to program the thoughts and beliefs of the generation that is coming up. <laughs> I, there's a whole, this deserves a whole new seminar. Just, right, just this concept right here, but I can't get into it right now. I want to show you how they're deliberately trying to addict people, though. 
Sean Parker said, oh yeah, the idea was you can't get people off the platform. You got to keep them on there and you got to deliver, give them a little dopamine hit every once in a while to keep them contributing content. And he's, he admitted, he apologized. He said, the inventors, the creators, uh, speaking of, of uh, social media, it's me, it's Mark Zuckerberg, it's Kevin Systrom on Instagram, it's all these people understood this, understood this dopamine dynamic, understood this consciously, and we did it anyway. Saying, what were we thinking? This was irresponsible. This was unethical. We did it anyway, even though we knew we were exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology, ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. And I'm not innocent. I was a social media addict in 1996. I'm going to listen to the sound of the dial up. And it goes. It's playing on my computer. I don't think you guys can hear it. But oh, what are these terrible noises say the modern people? Like, is this from the Stone Age? It was the dial up. We were calling the internet. And look at the imagery here. I've got to mute that. It's so obnoxious. You're alone. But if you move into the internet, you will be online as a happy togetherness. And you get on there and you're like, I'm going to check my email, electronic mail. Did I get any? Did I get any? <gasps> you got mail. I did dopamine. Ding, 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 ding. I was so addicted as a teenager looking up the profiles of girls on there that I thought were good looking. Like this was so inappropriate and a waste of time. The study of more than, so I say that so young people don't think like I'm just judging and condemning and I don't know what I'm talking about. Like I was in there, I was on the cutting edge even before MySpace, right? I'm not bragging by the way, it's kind of embarrassing to admit, but the study of more than 400 eighth and 11th graders found that many teenage texters had a lot in common with compulsive gamblers, including losing sleep because of texting, problems cutting back on texting, and lying to cover up the amount of time they spent texting. I told you they're deliberately trying to addict, right? Sean Parker said, you gotta give them that little dopamine hit. So they act like comp compulsive gamblers with their, with their Snapchat use or whatever the platform is. James Williams worked in the advertising at Google and he, he created one of the most important advertising metrics in the history of the internet. And he was looking at a bunch of displays on this multicolored screens one day. And he tells the story that he was what we would call convicted the pangs of guilt erupted within his soul. And he said, do you realize that data point right there, that's about a million people that we just caused in the last 20 minutes to do something that they wouldn't have otherwise done. And it's not in their best interest. So we're manipulating and messing with people. The lar he, he speaks out now against the largest, most standardized and most centralized form of attention control in human history. That's a strong statement. And God has the answer to all this because without the power of Christ, this is a lost generation getting owned by big tech. But the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him and whom Jesus sets free, you will be free indeed. And that we don't need to be conformed to the standard that the mainstream media and big tech and the entertainment industry is trying to create for this generation. We can be transformed by the renewing of our minds, no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. This is Dr. Peter Weibrow at UCLA Neuroscience. He calls screen time and video games and social media electronic cocaine. And other research, researchers in China call it digital heroin. Andrew Doan at the Pentagon Addiction Research, he talks about digital pharmacia. That was such a good one. I had to borrow that for disc four of the media mind. Disc one is how to be human again. Disc two is the disconnected childhood. Disc three is antisocial media. Disc four is digital pharmacia. And disc five, which I'm not even touching in this session, is people of the book in the age of the app, where we talk about literature and physical books and multitasking, distraction and screen-based everything. That's a fun session, but I don't have time for it today. Back to Cardaras. He says, these devices are like a digital drug. Recent brain imaging research is showing that they affect the brain's frontal cortex, which controls executive functioning, including impulse control, in exactly the same way that cocaine does. He, he calls it a digital drug like cocaine. Uh, Ian Bogost is one of the famous uh, video game creators. He says, video game industry, that's the cigarettes of this century. It's a scandal what they are doing to young people. The media mind, addicted. The mind of Christ, free. But I got to show you a couple more things on addiction, and then we're going to wrap up. But don't forget that the son, whom the son sets free, he is free indeed. 
you can break free from these things by the act of the will and the power of God. You might say, I don't have enough willpower to give up my media addiction. No, you don't have enough willpower, and neither do I. But you have a will, and God has the power. So you have will power, cooperating with the divine power. Kardara says, your kid's brain on Minecraft looks like a brain on drugs. No wonder we have a hard time peeling kids from their screens and find our little ones agitated when their screen time is interrupted. He used the phrase brain on drugs, which brought me back to when I was watching TV in the 80s. Ironically, TV. But some good people, some good people with the Partnership for a Drug-Free America saw how people's lives were being ruined by drugs in the 60s and 70s and the cocaine epidemic in the 80s. And they said, we're going to help the young people realize how bad this is. So what they did is they put this ad on TV with an egg. And they would, most of you remember this, they would take the egg and a voice would go, this is your brain. And then they'd have the frying pan all heated up with oil or butter and they'd crack the egg, frying egg. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? And it was super intimidating to a kid who's like, whoa, okay, apparently drugs are really bad. <laughs> and it effectively messaged a generation I never did drugs. I loved the world. I was a pleasure seeker. I loved everything that that that, that I thought would be uh, something pleasurable to me. But what drugs looked like to me as I rationally calculated the situation is it looked like a trap. And it was. In fact, so was the worldly media. I didn't get that messaging. But I never did drugs because they warned us. I'd have chapel speakers come in when I was a kid in school in sixth grade or seventh grade. And I remember this guy come in. He's like, hey, kids. I'm from the 60s. I did a lot of drugs and I played in the band. And what was I going to say next? I don't remember. Don't do drugs. And I'm like, wow, that's a testimony right there. And he does, he seems like that really affected him. And he's saying, don't do drugs. So I didn't do drugs. Praise God, I didn't do drugs. Um, my point is not about drugs, it's about video games, pornography, these addictive media that are ruining the lives of young people today. We need a message like the frying pan thing for these young people. And I don't know what that is. It's you reaching out and showing love and concern and spending time, offering our time to do other things than media um, for our young people. But I wanna close with that one. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I mean, we've covered a lot in this session, not just addiction, we've looked at thought control. We've looked at mental health. We've looked at the disruption of relationships. We've looked at many different angles and aspects of this. And when we find the life that God has created for us to live, and we rediscover what it means to be human, it's the image of God being restored in man, the definition of redemption. That's what redemption is. And God says, I've got a better plan for you. Try something else. And when you'll find yourself freed from the addiction, freed from the manipulation, freed from the, the discouragement and the darkness that surrounds you. And when you experience more of Christ, he will help you to live that life to the full, the abundant life that Jesus promised to us. So I'm going to hand it right over to Christy. And she's going to bring up some Q&A, I believe. Thank you so much, Scott. I know we all really, really appreciated hearing um, your message. And um, we do have a few questions here, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, we have Gabriel who asked, I work with teenagers in my church. What can we do to get their attention back from their mobile devices and media and make the Bible attractive to them? I would start with just doing fun things together. And, you know, the, the Bible, they're going to they're gonna really connect with the Bible when they connect with you as you're connecting with them in nature and in the Bible. So it's all about connection. The way that you disciple somebody, that you win a soul, is Christ's method alone, right? And uh, for, for young people, that's, that's having fun, doing fun things together. Uh, I literally have on one of these yellow pads at home, I have dozens of these yellow pads everywhere with different things. One of my yellow pads is a checklist of with my own kids that every week I do something fun one-on-one -on -one with each kid that we do a family recreation time a certain number of times per week. And I've got it on a checklist. And if it's like Wednesday and I haven't, you know, I'm behind, I'm like, okay, I, tomorrow I got to do a bunch of this. And whether it's youth ministry or parenting or whatever, that it's really, it begins with that connection. Um, you can't make them stop their media. 
you know, that's a that's a parental governance thing. Share my material with their parents, and oh, that would that would go a long ways because they're going to develop a taste for the Word of God when they start to get off of the addiction of media and start to find the joy and the freedom in, in living differently, living with real things and real people and nature and all of that. So yeah, hopefully that's a good start. I mean, you're in youth ministry. I'm sure you've got lots of creative ideas that I haven't even begun to grasp, but. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, we have another question from Juan, which is um, similar to that. And it says post COVID-19, there's so much, um, that we can do in, in this climate, but how can we engage teens, bringing them into a love relationship with Christ? And I think you kind of touched on that, um, but this is more specifically talking about like that relationship with Christ. Um, what are your thoughts on that? You know, we need to model that. Um, if, if the young people see around them, people who just do churchianity, you know what I mean? It's like, we're, we're pew potatoes. We go through a routine and ritual and there's no heart in it. There's no fire and vibrancy and service and sacrifice in our religion, they're going to see that that's nothing to be excited about. And of course they won't be excited about it. And may, they may develop a relationship with Christ in spite of us, but how about we give them some help by really going deep with Christ ourselves. And that's really going to be the most powerful thing we can do because they see the energy and the joy that you have. And they're like, that's something I want. You know, the young people, they'll look up to, and, and I, I had, uh, I've seen young people scoff at and make fun of you know the missionary minded on fire christian and then at the end of the day when they're not around their friends and they're honest they say you know that was the person actually that i looked up to and respected and maybe there was a more relevant and cool and with it person who didn't get made fun of but their 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 standards left something to be desired. And they talk about the movies they're going to with the young people and whatever. And the young people would lose respect for that person's walk with Christ because they didn't see the, 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 the real legitimacy of, of Jesus sanctifying the life. He was fun and whatever, but anyway, I've, just, I, I, I've, I've seen examples like that out there where you might think you're not reaching them because you're all about Jesus, but we don't, we don't want to water it down to try to reach them they will actually respect and look up to a vibrant Christian walk with, with Jesus Christ that's fully principled and is not judgmental and rude and angry and like you're just, you know, being, being uh, obnoxious and flaunting it. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a, you know, Christ-like character. That, that it, The Bible says his love compels us, right? And so it'll, be a, it'll have a drawing power. Only by love is love awakened. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And I really appreciate how you touched on that authenticity there, like practice what you preach. Because um, young people, especially, I think are really in tune to that hypocrisy. Um, so I think that's a very good point. Um, okay, so here's another one. There was some conversation going back and forth on the chat and um, it was brought up, you know, we're living in these COVID times and a lot of people are kind of forced to be on their computer all the time, whether they like it or not. So what are your thoughts about that? How can we maybe manage that i mean if you're if you're working from home and your job is on the computer you're on you're facing a lot of screen time so how do you maybe find that balance or what what are your thoughts on that yeah and i've gotten that question for a couple of years since i've been doing this media mind seminar on screen time in general and because some people just have worked on computers even before covid it's just a larger number of people now who are facing that method of having to do their work I'm one of them, right? <laughs> How am I doing seminars now? Um, I used to be able to do them in person, although I'm happy to not be on airplanes all the time, but um, I hear you, it's, it's a challenge. And to me, you gotta put in the time that you gotta put in for work if that's your job. I mean, unless this is so problematic that you're looking for a new job or something, but I wouldn't uh, you know, compel that upon somebody. But the key is what are we doing with our non-mandatory screen time? Are we adding more screen time to that? Because, you know, it was eight hours of parents being on their screens on top of work time. And that's just for entertainment and social media. So if we can bring that a little closer to zero, then we're going to be getting, you know, a much better balance. But if we're just piling and piling and piling more screen time on top of the stuff we already have to do for work, our kids for school, um, you know, I would advocate for physical books and getting the kids hands in the soil. And I wish I could do the seminar on true education right now, because I'm concerned about everything going screen based for kids. But um, yeah, I, I understand the problem. 
literally. I'm on, I'm on my computer a lot. I make these slideshows for PowerPoints and I'm communicating on email and stuff. So I just find I gotta, I, I like to um, personally get out and, and do agriculture. Uh, our okay. family has some, some land and we're blessed to be in the country. And so that's kind of a little hobby, hobby farm and a greenhouse and um, go for jogs outside and just find things other than media that you love to do so that when the media time is over that you have to be doing, then you're like, oh, all right, I'm going to do this. And it might not be easy. It might take a, okay, I got to discipline myself to not just sit there and watch TV and, and, and make that choice, you know, and then, then that balance will, will come in better. Yeah, I think that's that's brilliant. Um, now, Scott, you did mention in the in the first seminar that we did earlier this morning um, how people can find your full the full set of information. Um, so, would you mind touching that uh, touching on that again? So, how can people access the full set? Absolutely. Whoever asked this question, you're so nice. <laughs> I, can, I can show people how to do this because our ministry does depend on people um, subscribing at beltoftruth.tv. So it's, am I sharing screen? Are you guys seeing this? Mm -hmm. Yep, you're good. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is beltoftruth.tv. And if you go over to content, you can see the subscription. That's a monthly subscription, but it's like a thousand dollars of content that's on here. This is the one we just did, the Media Mind. All five episodes are streaming on demand right there. The media mind, the media on the brain from this morning, six videos, the parenting seminar, the one called schooled, how there's a deliberate agenda to destroy individuality, reduce intelligence, and re-engineer society. That's a heavy one right there. That's our second most popular seminar, the one on true education. There's a ton of stuff in here on current events, what's really going on with the COVID situation, uh, religious liberty stuff, prophecies in current contemporary times, 22-part series. I got to give you a little bit of a disclaimer, though. Don't watch these things binge watching. People binge watch Second Beast Rising. They binge watch COVID dystopian. I'm like, oh no, I'm part of the problem. No, watch these things in moderation. I know the media mind is exciting and fast paced and I have to do that to keep people's attention. But I hope it's not so exciting that people are becoming addicted. But um, that's all on there at one place. Then there's beltoftruthministries.org. That's where you can go and get the DVDs if you're a DVD person. Right here on the store, you can see all the ones there. Oh, and email Priya at beltoftruthministries at gmail.com. Beltoftruthministries at gmail.com because she's going to give you a major discount code to apply if you want to get the DVDs. And you, you don't want to buy these without the discount code because it's a big discount code. And she'll give you a free digital download of something special that she's sharing for us, for you. Um, so that's beltoftruthministries at gmail.com. I think that pretty much covers the the uh, question there, Christy. You can go right on to the next one. Awesome, thanks, Scott. Yeah, everyone definitely, um, you know, send Priya that email because he doesn't like a, a discount and free stuff. So, um, all right, we're going to be wrapping up here soon. But this question just came in: How can one maybe encourage an adult um, who has a, a media addiction and doesn't realize that they have this addiction? You know, one of the great things about putting out media about media is it reaches people where they're at you know the cynic and the skeptic who's so smart is like Scott, you're putting out media and you're preaching it against media that's the point i'm i'm going on the turf of the people who are struggling with it because they won't need they're not necessarily going to pick up a book i love to write i've written books you can see those on the website too you can buy our books but um honestly this might sound kind of weird because it's my stuff but the best thing that i can share is what's on those dvds uh, media on the brain and the media mind. Um, you could pick up the condensed edition. Maybe they don't want to watch 13 episodes of content. Maybe just the four episode condensed edition would help them. But honestly, the best thing that I can do for people in terms of educating them is give them material and information. And it works best when it's not you shoving it in their face. You know what I mean? Um, Oh, have you heard of Scott Ritzema's media on the brain stuff? Would you be willing to watch this together? Maybe it'd be fun. Or, you know, if it's a spouse, kind of like bribe them a little bit. Or something, you know? <laughs> um, definitely pray. That's going to be the most powerful thing there is. Other, beyond, even more important, obviously, than, than information would be the power of prayer. Yeah. Amen to that. 
Um, all right, we have one or two more questions here. Uh, so Juan again is asking, do podcasts cause some of the same effects as other media? So like, say you're listening to a podcast while you're exercising or doing something like that. Does that have any of the same effects? I love to listen to stuff on my phone. So um, maybe I'm biased, but I'm a huge <laughs> fan of audio. I don't know of any studies that show that information, audio, books on tape, um, podcasts, uh, radio broadcasts of informational talk, that sort of thing, um, sermons, I, that's all very, very good. I don't know of a single thing that would show that that's having a similar effect as um, social media, video games, and some of those. I mean, you can gauge it in yourself, like try a different set of lenses and being like, okay, do I have the right balance here? Like maybe it's too much of this kind of thing and I need to bring in some more of that kind of thing. But this is my books app right there. I love my books app. See what I'm listening to right yeah. there. Let's see where, yeah, Testimonies love for the it. Church, volume two. And um, boy, that one's hard hitting. You want some stuff that like convicts, get the book Maranatha, listen to that, or go through the testimonies. There's some awesome stuff. So I love the books app. I have the podcast app, uh, the audio verse app. There's so much good stuff to listen to. I'm a big fan of, of listening to things on audio while you exercise or if you're doing manual labor or whatever. You might as well feed the soul with good things, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that because um, I am definitely a huge fan of my, my podcasts and my audiobooks. So, um, well, that was the last question. So do you have any final words um, to wrap, wrap, us, wrap it up? Any final parting thoughts? Yes. The most important thing that I've said all day is that really we have not been talking about media per se. Um, this is a seminar ultimately about redemption, our relationship with Jesus Christ, and living the three angels' messages so that we can hasten the soon coming of Jesus. Uh, if we're just making media changes in our lives so that we can get off of addictions and be more happy because of it, if we are just making changes in our media use um, because we want to not be mind controlled so we can be individuals, we might be like, those sound like awesome things, but there's an even higher, higher calling. And that is our, not only our salvation, but our witness and freeing up our time to do the work of God. So when we start living this, we experience Jesus. And this whole seminar is all about Jesus. It's all about what he is doing in us, with us, and through us. And so just take that in prayer to God. Like, okay, I've learned a bunch of crazy information today. What do I do with this? I don't want just information. I want transformation. God, what do you want me? What kind of lenses shall I try on? So I just challenge everybody to pick something to try. And maybe removing something and replacing it with something better. That's the key, the something better. Of these trees ye may freely eat. Don't go to the one that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but go to all the other trees and, and rediscover God's plan for your life in service and relationships and in everything. And also one more thing on the, those who are feeling discouraged, those who are feeling alone, just know that Jesus is right there with you and that there are people that are thinking about you and praying for you. And drop me a line and send me a prayer request, beltoftruthministries at gmail.com. And um, you're cared for. Just I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm there with you. I wish I could be there with you. It's too bad we had to do this online, but it's better than nothing, right, Christy? Yeah, it's better than nothing. And we really, really appreciate you coming on and, and doing this with us. It's been a blessing. Take yeah. care, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much, Scott. Bye-bye.